Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have you with us today. Our goal with Founderline is to provide a forum where people who are interested in startups can get their questions answered. So this could be you're a founder who's working on a company and you have an issue you're working on, or you're an aspiring founder who might uh, want to start a company at some point, or maybe you're thinking of joining a company and you have some questions about how to evaluate an opportunity, whatever it might be, uh, we're here to help you and uh, see if we can answer your questions. This is a live show and the only way it works is if you reach out to us and ask some great questions. Uh, there are multiple ways you can do that. You can call us uh, toll free. The number is 1-844-4-FOUNDER. That's 1-844-436-8633. Uh, you can email us. The email address is help at founderline.com or you can tweet. The Twitter handle is at founderline. With that, let's get the show started. Our guest today is Jeff Clavier, the founder and managing partner of SoftTech VC. Jeff is a pioneer in the seed VC space and his firm has made over 150 investments since he started in 2004. Companies like Mint and Milo, Eventbrite, August, and many, many others. Uh, they're currently investing out of their Fund 4, which is an $85 million fund closed uh, this summer, I believe. Yes. So, uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Welcome to Founderline. Thank you for doing this, Joe. It's awesome, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, before we, we dive in and uh, start answering some of the questions that's, that are coming in, I usually spend a few minutes just chatting and getting to know you a little sure. bit. You and I know each other, but uh, the people out there might not. So. Uh, you know, I, I, I read through some stuff and I know you moved here in 2000 yes, and we're 14 um, years ago. Uh, yeah, it seems like seems longer. Right. Uh, uh, and we're originally with Reuters Venture Capital. Right. Yes. And um, at some point in uh, in the early 2000s, you said, hey, I'm going to go off and do my own fund. So how did that how did that come about? Like, what was the uh, what was the thinking there? So at the end of 2003, early 2004, I started seeing a few startups that were in the, you know, B2C space, business to consumer. Yeah. They were very, very early. And the one characteristic that was uh, striking to me was that they had managed to build a team and put a product together and launch it without any real sort of financing or with just, you know, uh, a bit of, of cash that they had uh, scraped together. And, and the products were very successful and, and really notable. And I thought that whilst, you know, five, six, seven years uh, earlier they would have needed, you know, five to 10 million to just get there. Yeah. The ability to sort of launch something on a few hundred K was really sort of intriguing. So I hung out a bit with those founders and realized that there was this shift towards capital efficiency that no funding model in place sort of was really sort of answering. And so um, I decided it was time for me to, uh, to jump out of my fund and uh, I started SoftTech in May of 2004 with a view to fund those types of companies. Um, there was no notion of a fund at the time. It was just me investing as a business angel. Okay. And you know, the reason why is that I didn't even know whether there was such a thing as you know, an early stage seed space that we could sort of carve out for ourselves. There wasn't, right? I there mean, wasn't. Eventually, you created it, right? Well, you know, with others, with other, I mean, Josh Koppelman was really the first to create an institutional fund with uh, first round capital, sort of one, and then you know we were like the third or fourth or whatever to put a fund together. But much later, in two thousand seven, for the first three years, I was just investing my own money as a business angel, as you've been doing yep. uh, for the last few years, and. Believe it or not, it was actually hard. I mean, you remember, it was actually hard to put together a two to three hundred thousand dollar round because you need like 10, 12 people to um, pull the resources together. Yeah. And so I did that and became pretty active, was uh, anointed one of the um, super angels by, you know, some dude at, I think, <laughs> Business 2.0, <or> whatever. <laughs> and, and then um, in 2007, raised. Uh, one of the first micro VC funds, uh, which we called Fund Two, to make it confusing, but that was the first sort of um, uh, you know managed fund raising capital from limited partners and putting together a more formal structure. Yeah. And uh, and then you know, ten years later, now uh, we're on to our fourth fund. Yeah. No, it's great, and and it's been it's been really interesting to see 
the evolution of this whole ecosystem. So, Indeed. so you know, walk us through from when you started to where we are now, ten years later. A lot has changed in terms of the how, how startups get get funded. The the costs have dropped dramatically. There's all sorts of stuff going on. So, what what changes have you seen as you've gone from just investing on your own to now sure. working with a bunch of partners? I think there's been a few um, sort of mega disruptions over the last 10 years. I would say about 10 years ago, you were investing as an angel, you had a few friends who were co-invested with you around the same themes, and you were essentially uh, aligning yourselves around those two, three, 500K rounds, and you had a couple of funds that were uh, getting going, but it was largely angels who became super angels who then, because of their success and track record, raised the first generation of micro VC funds. And for the first, I want to say three years, uh, micro VC funds were not considered like, you know, real things. We were sort of perceived by traditional VCs as sort of a, an annoying thing that was, was going to, you know, pass out because there was just not a seed space per se in the ecosystem. It was, a, it was viewed as a temporary thing almost. Temporary right? thing, yeah. yeah. And then, um, I would say around 2008, 2009, uh, people were really sort of starting to see the value of those seed stage investors that were taking a lot of risk by backing companies sort of much earlier in their, um, in their existence. And suddenly, people realized that capital efficiency was going to be not like the characteristic of just a handful of business to consumer companies, but it was sort of the way to build startups yeah. in general. Yeah. And you started sort of seeing, um, you know, this, this other sort of disruption, which was incubators, accelerators, sort of Y Combinator, tech stars, really starting to create an ecosystem for founders very early in the life of the companies to get support, mentorship, and, and, and facilitation around fundraising. And so fast forward, you know, a few years, uh, you start having, you know, a number of seed funds. Most of the super angels essentially graduated and raised their own sort of seed funds, became household names that were seeked by entrepreneurs to get, you know, the initial financing. Yeah. There was a structure where uh, seed rounds became slightly larger from, you know, half a million to a million, and now it's like two to three million, yeah. you know, clearly. Um, and these traditional VCs either decided to invest at seed stage, that was sort of the rage, I would say, uh, between 2008, 2009, and 2011, 2012, where they said, well, we can do seed investments as well. And they realized that by investing in 50, 60, you know, 100 seed stage companies, but only doing a handful of Series A's, they were actually creating a problem for themselves and their brands. And now we've largely seen uh, most VCs sort of retreat from the seed world and just work with us as you know downstream uh, sort of investors. So um, we invest uh, you know anywhere from a million and a half to uh, three million. That's the size of the round. Softech will do half a million, two million, buying seven, ten percent of the companies. That's that round will last for eighteen to twenty-four months, and then at some point uh, during that that sort of period of time, uh, typically after 12, 15, 18 months, you're going to go and pitch those Series A investors and you're going to go raise, you know, your Series A. The Series A's actually, you know, have changed as well. In, you know, a few years ago, it was common to see four to five million dollar Series A's. Right. And now you're looking at eight to ten million dollar Series A's. And right. so there's a shift where there's almost sort of the seed world has become, you know, the old Series A. Yeah. Yeah, it's the new uh, the new Series A, and and uh, I mean it's it's confusing because then someone threw in the Series Seed nomenclature as well, right? So uh, and you have the pre-seed, which is you know very early seed. You have the seed round, which is quite large, and the Series A, which is now uh, you know pretty sizable. And then the the last disruption I would mention is crowdfunding. So Angel List and all those sort of crowdfunding platforms yeah. that have given access to re more retail investors, you know, a view, a sort of a peek at the deal flow of successful angels and funds and given them the ability to back uh, you know, early stage startups, which means that from the standpoint of the entrepreneur, they have a lot of opportunities to, to get funded. Yep. And well, you know, funding used to be uh, a buyer, like, you know, it was really a pretty serious uh, challenge that you had to overcome to start your company. Now I would say it's much easier to get 
you know, some financing, you know, whether it's uh, going through an incubator, raising from a seed fund, and then a syndicate of investors, going an angel list, uh, you know, running a crowdfunding sort of um, a campaign on, on the platform. And then, you know, it's up, you know, it's up to you to execute and prove you're worthy of that Series A, which is ultimately the first real hurdle that is still hard to overcome. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and even, you know, syndicates now, you, some, someone can pull together a syndicate with 300K, 500K, right? And, uh, and, and you know, with, with one decision from an individual, yes. all these people behind it, uh, I, I kind of wonder where that's going to go if they're going to be doctors and lawyers losing money and, and suing people at some point, but uh, it's really that's always phenomenon. That's always the risk. And, you know, right now it feels good because you have, you know, the IPO window which has reopened. There are yeah. some, you know, pretty active sort of M&A um, sort of happening. So it feels really good to everyone. But I sort of re I remind everyone who wants to be an Android investor that this is sort of one of the easiest sort of way to lose money, uh, <laughs> including going to Vegas yeah. uh, and betting it. And so... If ever you want, you're tempted to um, uh, to join uh, to join in and, and be an Android investor. You really want to do it with capital that you you can assume being lost. Yeah. Because yeah. unfortunately, that's the most likely outcome. Yeah, I've I've heard some horror stories where someone will put half their net worth into you know angel investing. You don't and, want that. And, you, you don't know, want that. And they can only do six deals or something, and that that's a bad uh, bad situation. So um, you've managed to invest in some really great companies over mm -hmm. the years, and I, w I always found it interesting to talk with investors about you know how they find those opportunities, and and then once you find them, in many cases they're competitive, how you end up winning the deal, and maybe you don't want to give away all your secrets from soft tech, but. Uh, but uh, walk us through, you know, some of that. Where where do these deals come from? So I mean, the we have this sort of referral network, and now that we're established, is it's sort of different from you know ten years ago when I get when I got started, where I was I was literally uh, a nobody, and I had to go and seek founders, and I was essentially offering help and trying to because. I wasn't, you know, a very experienced VC. I had done four years of venture capital, and after four years, you don't know much at all. It takes ten years to even start having a clue. Uh, but I was trying to help founders, and at the time, you know, back in 2004, you didn't have the the sort of transparency and visibility on uh, VC terms and process and term sheets and so on and so forth. So the fact that you had a um, you know semi-experienced VC that was sort of sitting next to you and explaining you know what it takes to actually get finance, uh, what the pitch deck looks like, what the process is, and how you actually go about getting finance was actually valuable. Yeah. Um, fast forward now, so we've backed 153 companies uh, over the last 10 years. So we've we've backed you know uh, 500 founders, uh, give or take. Uh, we've worked with uh, you know. 200 angels, a bunch of VCs, and so on and so forth. And all this creates a referral network uh -huh. that when a founder goes to them and says, oh, I'm going to go and raise money for, you know, company XYZ, they sort of look at the, the keywords, um, SaaS, Internet of Things, uh, marketplaces, uh, mobile infrastructure, and they say, oh, Softec is a great investor for this kind of company, let me introduce you to um, Steph uh, or Charles or Jeff. And we sort of look at all those referrals and we try and infer whether this person who makes the referral knows us well. And if it's someone who says, you know, this is an awesome entrepreneur you should really meet, then we just like, you send me a deal, I will sort of look at it. Uh, and we try and figure out, you know, is this something that is high on our priority list in terms of sectors we want to invest in? Yeah. Is it in a geography that um, you know is sort of interesting to us? Uh, is it at a stage that is compatible with our investment strategy? And you know, then we'll sort of bring in the person for the first uh, sort of meeting, and then there will be a process that eventually, maybe one day, will yield you know an investment. Just to give you a sense of numbers, um, we get anywhere from four to 700 referrals uh, per quarter, and we invest in three to five companies per quarter. Yep. So low probability. Very low probability. Yeah, yeah I think that's one of the hardest things for founders to understand is 
what, what was wrong with me or what did, what did I Nothing do? Nothing wrong yeah, with me. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. like you, man. Yeah, and, and so... Because we actually had this story where I had to pass on, on Joe's uh, little may, startup. Maybe a good decision, uh, as it turns out. But uh, uh, no, but it's, it, you know, it, it's it's not you. It's 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 not a fit, right? Or, yep. it, or you know, they don't believe the thesis or whatever it is. You shouldn't be offended. So you know? we look at, you know... I still talk to you. Uh, even Of though. course. Yeah. We're still friends. And and that's always sort of awkward when you have your friends coming to pitch you and you have to say, well, it's nothing personal. It's business, right? Yeah, yeah. I still like you. I just didn't like your idea. <laughs> um, I told you that, though, right? You did. You absolutely did. And, and so, quickly, too, which is the other key factor. But go, go ahead. And so, you know, we, th- we look at um, all those founders, you know, awesome. And is there like a founder market fit? So do we believe that those founders for that particular sort of opportunity are really sort of a, an awesome fit? Do we believe that the product is really sort of differentiated? Or is it one of those where, you know, we meet one company on Monday, another one on Wednesday, and then the third one on Friday, and they pitch us exactly the same thing, ah. which happens a lot. These really? Days. Really, seriously. Um, we even have this notion of, I like the, the, the market, I like the product concept, I just, I'm not sure about the team. Let's wait for the next one. Because you because you know it's coming. Because we know it's coming. Wow, that's crazy. And then if all the stars align and, and God knows it's hard to um, create you know a successful company, then let's make sure that this is operating in a market where the company can become really sort of massive or, or iconic. So you know we've we've had the luxury you mentioned them. So we were in Mint, we were in um, you know Eventbrite, we were in Fitbit. Uh, those are companies which have really sort of uh, created something in the marketplace and and have created a category of, like the mint of something actually was a category a few, yeah, a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, Fitbit has become, you know, the household name in, uh, in wearables. So those are the kinds of companies that, A, you want to try and finance, and B, you need, you know, to make the fund economics work. So you need two or three of those per fund yeah. to just uh, create a very successful fund. Good. Well, I, the the interesting one recently was this uh, push for pizza thing. I don't know if you saw that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, it, you know, I'm like, okay, the next one push for burrito, you know, push for taco, like what, whatever the next apps are going to yep. be. And uh, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. But, uh, well, why don't we, um, we've got some questions coming in. So why don't we see if we can help some people out. And um, uh, let's see, the first one uh, is from Larry. I don't know if we have a regular um, Larry uh, from Yuba City who always hey, sends stuff in. So. <laughs> Uh, it says, this question is for both of you. What can you build into your company, for example, politics, culture, or policies, culture, to support failing quickly and cheaply in order to make course corrections as quickly as possible? It's a great question. I think the, the, the point is to um, sort of um, get very early on the um, uh, customer feedback and, and a, v- a very clear sense of uh, KPIs, so things that you're going to measure and you're going to look at either improving or setting sort of some goals around to figure out whether you're sort of trending as you should or, 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 or you're not. And yep. measurements and setting you know, goals is always sort of the way to, um, to do that. The challenge is, you know, very early on, what are you know, the signs that a company is sort of growing nicely and as it should or, or not? Yeah. And that's why you sort of go to... Uh, uh, more established entrepreneurs or investors will typically sort of help you to do that and say, well, you know, how do we measure wh- whether we're sort of going, you know, the right way? Um, and that's, it's, it's always sort of difficult when you look at those KPIs because it's typically, you know, something you look in the rear and say, yeah, we've sort of reached the sort of level of, of revenue and revenue growth uh, that, that we need to satisfy, you know, the hurdles for the next round. Um, so we'll, we'll establish those, like it's easier when revenue is the metric, mm. like for software as a service companies, we sort of know the shape and curve of that, um, that revenue growth that you need to attract investors. Um, for business to consumer companies, it's, it's less obvious because it's typically based on traction, retention, things like that. Yeah. So you sort of set up those goals, you sort of share them with fellow entrepreneurs, potential investors, get some feedback and then measure and, and look at those on a regular basis to see whether you're making good progress. Yep. No, I, I totally agree. So um, great question, Larry. Thank you. Um, this one is from Ian. Uh, what are you seeing for valuations right now? We are two technical founders with an MVP, minimum viable product, and some traction. 
So tough question, right? It, 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 I'm sure it varies greatly, but uh, it varies greatly. I think you know what is what is true is with a very large supply of capital, you know, out there between the I want to I want to guess billions of dollars now available to seed funds to invest, all the angel investors who are crowding angel list and so on and so forth you really have a lot of capital available to fund interesting opportunities. And if your credible founders, if your MVP sort of looks good, if your initial traction, whatever that means, is interesting, then, you know, the good news is you will be able to raise capital. Then the question is, you know, from whom? And my advice to entrepreneurs is always to try and find um, investors who have a great track record themselves in supporting uh, great founders and really select your investors on the basis of value add versus how much they're willing to pay. Mm. And typically, you know, we're value added investors, but we're always, you know, valuation conscious because we have a fund to run and, and, and a lot of returns to uh, actually deliver to our own investors. And so we always sort of be valuation conscious and we look at what the company has, has achieved and we'll say, well, we think that, you know, this is this is a five pre-investment, this is a seven pre-investment, this is a 10 pre-investment, and that's based on how far the company has gone in terms of execution, in terms of de-risking, and, you know, if ever it's a software as a service company in terms of revenue. Makes sense. That's but, good. you know, what I can say is that the valuations have definitely crept up uh, over the last uh, couple of years, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, Ian, I, I would just add, um, if, if you're looking at something, it really focus on who the investor is, as Jeff said, you know, it's um, who you're working with is way more important than any of those other things, unless there's some really weird terms in there or something yeah. like that. But uh, very that, clean terms, seed, seed, um, series seed documents are available on the web. That's the basis of, you know, what we use and what most uh, micro VC use these days. And then, um, you know, in terms of valuations, uh, something which is fair for both sides, yeah. right? Yeah. Get um, you know some some help, some feedback from fellow uh, entrepreneurs. But remember one thing: the only valuation that matters is the one that someone's going to invest <laughs> agrees with. The fact that exactly. your buddy says, "Oh, you're totally you know a twenty post company," and he doesn't invest, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, here's one from Michael. It says, you mentioned on your website that you help about 15 companies per year to staff up, launch their product, and build their sales and marketing engine so they can raise future funds. Yes. How do you help them launch their product? What services do you provide to help your companies? So I think it's, um, you know, for us, we sort of look at what the company has in terms of assets um, you know, do they have a marketing person? Do they have, and if they don't, then we either uh, help find, you know, the right marketing person or the right, uh, you know, product person or the right. So whatever holes they have in the organization, we try and either find a way to patch the hole, and that might be sort of ourselves or, or some people we know in the community, or we help them sort of recruit and, and, and retain the right sort of um, executives. Uh, because one of the things that you do at seed stage is start building the executive team around the founders. Yep. And then, you know, we help them with uh, whether it's their uh, brand marketing, whether it's their product marketing, whether it's, you know, we, we never substitute ourselves to the company, but we have enough operating experience on the team with, you know, my partner Charles who's, who's one of the greatest um, sort of biz dev guys in the valley and uh, Steph who's a, an awesome sort of marketing person, you know, we sort of can use our own experience and expertise to help them, you know, go through uh, their launch planning launch and then eventually figure out those sort of milestones that we talked about, you know, to get the uh, the next round of financing sort of secured. And part of one of one big thing that we do all the time is to figure out which firms and when should our founders sort of engage with in mm -hmm. order to secure sort of financing. Over the last um, nine months, we've done 22 financings for the ones, you know, A's and B's and, uh, and a couple of C's. And so it's, you know, we're pretty happy with uh, with that record. Yeah, and that, that aspect is really critical, right? Trying mm -hmm. to, um, trying to get the companies to to those KPIs that you yep. talked about so that, you know, a Series A or B investor is going to be ready to go. So, um, so Michael, hopefully um, that helps you out. Uh, 
Let's see, this one is from Robert. Uh, what is the best way to get to know an investor before making a decision about accepting an investment? Kind of an interesting uh, twist on it, Great right? question. No, no, abs yeah. very, very important. I'm, I'm glad you asked, Robert, yeah. thank you. I think you should spend the same time getting to know the investor and, and doing uh, reference checks on their portfolio. And we, we welcome and we actually offer um, our own you know, uh, sort of CEOs as references for ourselves when we talk to um, entrepreneurs about working with us because you want to make sure that our values and the way we work with people is sort of compatible with the way you want to engage with us. Yeah. So if you're a software as a service company, and you know, I did that recently for an investment which I can't talk about because that's the one we were talking offline, it's yeah. not announced yet. Yeah. And the CEO spent, you know, basically a, about a week uh, talking to three or four of my CEOs and then she went around the network sort of trying to gauge you know what people who hadn't offered as references would say about me as a board member and investor to make sure that you know the set of values that we have and the way we engage and you know we're, we're very engaged we're, we we get involved in our companies but we're also sort of pretty you know pretty tough we yeah. If things don't go well, we try and work together to fix them. And if things go great, then we try and push you to go even, you know, better and faster. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, demanding investors, but the, you know, the upside is we actually spend a lot of time and deploy a lot of resources to make you successful. And I, I'll ask the flip side, which is, um, does it make you nervous if? the people you're investing in don't check you guys out or don't go and do references or wh wh what's what's your take on that? I think, you know, it's it's a great question and those are sort of the, the sort of little signs. So the, there is this interesting period of time when you're sort of dating, <laughs> right? You put down a term sheet and you have a few weeks to figure out how the relationship is going to go based on, you know, how you behave during the uh, the legal phase where we're going to negotiate the documents. And, you know, every time we sort of talk together about the company, do I feel that, you know, this interaction sort of makes me feel good and it's, it's, it doesn't sort of trigger the spidey sense that, unfortunately, whenever it starts going off means, ooh, I'm not sure this is something which I'm as excited as I was at the beginning. Like and crazy so, stuff in the legal documents or... Or, you know, you know things that you should have disclosed. Uh, and, oh, yeah, you know, there was... We started, you know, with three co-founders and now there's two. And, you know, yeah, yeah. that guy sort I of meant to tell you threatened about that. To, lose, to sue us. And you know, so, you know, all those things should be plain vanilla on the table. and. Look, not everything starts, you know, super rosy and, and everybody sort of stumbles, but it's all about establishing a, a fundamental sort of trust in the relationship and expect people to be very open about th those things. And, you know, yes, if ever they don't ask for references, it might mean that, you know, they're a bit naive in the way they sort of uh, run the company. And, yeah, yeah. You know, um, early sort of engagement with customer I and mean, we, we take those calls as well like if someone has already you know engaged with uh, customers then we call those customers and we sort of try and figure out how that sort of went because um, yes you can course correct and fix things but sometimes it's it's uh, a bit more of an issue it's like the behavior right someone who's kind of messy and and you know, not really paying attention to the commitment, the commitments they make, which means that they actually always sort of break them, uh, is very serious, and you want to know about that. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, and I, I, I do. I don't know what that period is, but it's it's uh, either cements it even further, like mm -hmm. wow, we we're lucky to be in this, yes. or oh man, there's some weird stuff going on here. Did we make the right decision, yes. right? And uh, those are those are tough. Uh, and and you know, every now and then, I mean, it's very rare because we we. We take, you know, putting down a term sheet very, 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 very seriously. But, you know, every now and then you just, during this sort of legal due diligence and, and period of time when you negotiate and so on and so forth, you find that, you know, the the founder or the founders end up sort of really negotiating way too hard or being flexible or you just go, look, I'm just not going to be the right investor for this opportunity. and. You should just not work with me, and, yeah. and then you sort of politely fade away. Yeah, yeah, that's tough. All right, well, um, we're gonna take a minute here to thank our sponsors. So relax, you know, have a I'm beverage. Uh, you're you. you're always relaxed. So um, uh, you know, this show would not be possible without the help of our two amazing sponsers, Ustream and Oric. 
And uh, first, let's start with Ustream. Uh, we originally met uh, Brad Hunstable, who's the CEO there, and uh, st started working with them and have had a great experience throughout. Um, we, you know, we, we weren't sure exactly how all this video streaming technology works, and it turns out it was really easy to get set up. Um, they were very supportive, um, you know, working with the team there. Uh, and so if you are thinking about doing some webcasting, whether it's uh, a meeting or you're going to do a show or, you know, whatever it might, might be, you definitely want to go and talk with Ustream. Uh, you can find out more on their website. It's uh, ustream.tv, and uh, I'm sure they'll help you out as well as they have with us. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Oric and uh, specifically Mitch Zukli, who's the chairman and CEO. Mitch is usually with us every week, but uh, this week is out. And um, uh, you know, I always tell people that when you're when you're building a startup, one one of the key things you need to do is find a great lawyer because uh, that person is, of course, going to take care of the basics, you know, negotiating the 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 financing docs and whatever else. But more importantly, they're going to be one of your key advisors. There's somebody who, when you have an issue or you're going through a situation like an acquisition or a financing or whatever it might be, they've seen so many of these transactions and they can be very helpful in helping you understand, you know, what's what's market right now. Uh, oh, you're pushing too hard. You don't want to piss Jeff off. Wh whatever it might be. So. Um, when, when you're getting started, get a great lawyer. I've worked with the team at, uh, at Oric now uh, many times, and, uh, and, and they're really great. Uh, you can find out more. Go to their website. It's oric.com. So um, normally we'd have the Ask the Lawyer segment now, mm -hmm. but Mitch is gone. So we're just going to dive back into uh, to questions, and let's see. Um, but I'll say that I'm super stoked that Ustream is involved. Brad is a good friend, and, and Ustream is one of my early investments. Oh, really? Oh, perfect. So we, we, I'm sure we planned that. Uh, they, actually, I, I'm not kidding. Like It literally took us 10 minutes to get the thing up and running yes. the first time. And that, that surprised me. I was kind of like, you know, I reserved like the afternoon, and uh, I'm like, I think it's working. You know, look at that. It used to be so. the case. You know, video was hard to produce. Uh, you know, several years ago, and now it's so much easier. Yeah, and they seem like they're doing great. And even even when we went over to Europe, like everything worked fine. Uh, uh, it was funny. I was I was uh, talking to my son uh, today, and he's he's really getting into watching live streaming of uh, of people playing Minecraft. Mm -hmm. and, and there's this guy. Uh, I think his name is Captain Sparkles or something. And he's he's making like three four million dollars a year yes. just you know running these things and i think it's on twitch and mm -hmm. on it, twitch yeah. you know it was, it which was, was just acquired uh, by youtube yeah, yeah exactly so it was it was it's just really interesting to see you know when, when i was growing up um you know you, you watch tv and you play video games and now you know they watch other people playing the video mm -hmm. games right and it's it's become this whole uh this whole category it's really uh really amazing so um Let's see, we have an email here from Henry. Uh, how many board members should we have after a seed round of 800K? Does SoftTech insist upon a board seat? So no, we don't insist on a board seat, except when we think that um, the company at its stage would actually benefit. So we look at the experience of the founders, we look at the space, we look at you know dynamic and, you know, will sort of advise uh, very often founders to create a board where they retain control. One of the big things uh, for founders early on is not to lose control um, of, of the votes of the company and uh, the control of the, bo the board. And so we'll say, hey, let's just have a um, three-person board with two founders and one seed investor that will represent the class. Uh, typically, the lead of the round and the lead in a financing is the one sort of establishing the terms, negotiating with the company right. and, and you know putting the ducks together. So that person will either get on the board or you know appoint someone who could be sort of a, a board representative for the class, could could be sort of an Android investor or someone who is you know really well geared towards supporting the company. Yeah. Um, the challenge that early stage founders have is unless they really sort of have a set of clear milestones and they know what they have to execute on, they're sort of blind and they will be blindsided yeah. in terms of how to know whether, you know, this path is sort of the right one, whereas, you know, this one was the one to choose. Um, 
in, in our experience, um, when we sort of lead and take, uh, let's say, about 10% of a, of a company uh, because we wrote a, a large check, then we, you know, we'll step on the board and, I mean, we'll offer to step on the board. And it's often sort of part of the value add because we'll work very closely with the team. We'll, you know, meet roughly six to eight times a year as a board. Uh, one of the key issues sometimes founder ha founders have is that they think it's going to be a waste of time. But yeah. no, it's not a waste of time to sit down every six to eight weeks and, and essentially look at, you know, how the company has performed against plan, where we're in terms of hiring, and it's kind of a, a well-structured way of getting feedback to the team, yeah. which you know trains them to be sort of ready for the Series A. Because yeah. this is the kind of thing that you know founders will have to do for the Series A. Because investors, when they invest, you know five, six, ten million dollars, they will get on your board. Exactly. And so it's exactly. it's a good practice, and we encourage it. Um, we think that you know we have capacity for five boards uh, per person in the firm, and you know we make sure that we only uh, have you know five board seats each. That's great. Yeah, I, I think you know I, I don't think in these early days these are board meetings where it takes three days to prepare for no. them, and you know these are but sometimes just sitting down and you know getting all the metrics together and walking through them right and talking about okay six months from now you're going to need to worry about raising the next round mm -hmm. or whatever it might be, right? So. And it's also a way to, um, you know, get uh, people on your team exposure to the board. And, you know, so it's, it's sort of uh, a good dry run for, you know, what happens when they, when they grow up yep. and they raise the Series A. Yeah, and hopefully they do grow up someday. Uh, all right, um, before I forget, uh, if you want to reach us, um, you can reach us multiple ways. You can call us, one eight four 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 founder you can email uh, help at founderline.com and you can tweet to at founderline. You seem to have lots of emails coming in today. Um, so um, this next one is from Maria. Uh, I'm a female startup founder and I'm finding it hard to tell if VCs aren't taking us seriously because I'm a woman, our idea is bad, or something else. Uh, what advice would you give me? So. You know, th this comes up a, a lot, and uh, w one of the hardest things, you know, as an investor that I find is when you have to tell someone, look, th this just isn't the right fit, you know, you're, you're probably not the right person to lead this effort or whatever it is, but um, I, I think Maria is feeling a little bit like, you know, maybe it has something to do with her being a woman. Um, what, what, what would you say to uh, someone asking that question? Well, it's, it's always very hard because, um, A, um, it's it's really not. I mean, as a founder, um, you sort of want to try and put your best foot forward and say, you know, this is why I, as a founder, I'm excited about the opportunities. Why I, as the CEO, am, am the right person to lead this company. And we sort of look at it and and sort of look at the experience, at the leadership which has been demonstrated, the market knowledge, and so on and so forth. And we either sort of feel that this there's a, uh, the right sort of founder market fit, or there isn't. Uh, we really try hard to um, have a lot of female founders in the portfolio. We have, you know, more than 10% of our companies have uh, female founders, and we wish there was more because yeah. uh, we think that, you know, that brings a lot of value uh, to the team to have a female on the team uh, of, of founders. Um, saying, you know, you're not the right founder because you're a female is just ridiculous. You look at the person, and you know, we sort of we try and, and never think as to whether this is. Uh, you know, female, male, ethnicity, sort of region, whatever. It's is this the right founding team that comes to us with this opportunity? And I think uh, for Maria, it's really a question of trying to get um, some friendly investors to have a heart to heart with her and say, look, the reason why people are passing based on what I've seen and heard is that you know either there's you know there's no market, the product is just not that interesting or you're just not convincing us that you are the right person for that opportunity. Yeah. And as as and the problem is VCs never like to say those things because yeah, yeah. you know they don't want you to be pissed at them. And the one thing which is um, sort of always humbling to me is once we have you know sort of this discussion with founders and we decide to pass, you know several of them will then become sort of refers to us and and some of the best companies have been referred to us. From by founders who had passed on us, hmm. uh, sorry, we, we had passed on. Yes, uh, yes. But we sort of displayed, you know, we just sort of pretty straightforward and said, hey, this is why we're passing. This is why we don't like it, and that's why, you know, 
you will have faced those sort of set of issues we think in the future as you build a company and you know mm, very often we're right and sometimes you know we, we pass on really incredible companies that become major successes so to maria it's really a question of getting feed trying to get that real feedback from a few friendly investors that will sort of give her the real reasons why she hasn't you know gotten any sort of traction in the fundraising and, and try and course correct yep no, but I there is such a thing as not being the right founder for an opportunity and you know you don't want to spend two three four years of your life trying to build something which you're the wrong founder for or where there's no real opportunity right yep. no absolutely and and i maria i think it's really important as jeff said get get somebody who you know will be honest with you and also you know try and listen very closely to what they're saying um all, all of the investors you meet with because some of them will kind of avoid it and maybe you, know, you got to read I like to with my partners or I've done too many deals this year um, yeah I mean, yeah but but I, I think the the best VCs and I I know Jeff and his team fall in this category are the ones who give it to you straight you know they may not like it for whatever reason um, you may end up disagreeing on it but um, you know the like I, I had to turn down two companies yesterday and I, I always I always dread it a little bit. I'm sure you know that yeah. feeling. Like, you know, they're good people and you want to see them succeed, but it's not the right thing for you. And and what they really appreciate is when you give them the feedback like, well, I, I just don't buy this piece of the story, yeah. whatever it is. And um, we, we may disagree on it. And of course, you should have conviction around that because you're the founder and you're doing this. But um, uh, and, and please go prove me wrong yeah. because, you know, that, that's... And that's we wish you well and, you know, we'll cheer for you from the sidelines. Yeah, absolutely. When, so Once you hit the uh, unicorn, uh, the billion dollar, you yeah. know. Yeah, then, then, then you can, uh, you know, send them the friendly email from your yacht in Worst the Caribbean. Worst pass ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I won't ask you that yet, but... Um, uh, all right, so uh, hopefully that helps, Maria. We have uh, a, an email here from Matthew... Um, how much of your success is due to how picky your firm is? What are some investments? Oh, here it is. What are some investments that you missed out on and wish you'd taken? Why did you pass on those? All right. So I don't know if you want to name the, sure, uh, of the I've, unicorn I've, that you missed or the six unicorns or uh, the ten. Or, I mean, it's it's building up. I think so. The success. Um, if you, if you sort of trace back the companies that we've backed, which have become sort of uh, great successes. They were, you know, essentially awesome entrepreneurs that had a, um, a sort of market-defining or market-disrupting sort of idea that they end up executing and, and building. So whether it's uh, uh, Aaron Patzer with Mint, which was uh, we're going to create a new category that, you know, eventually uh, will disrupt Quicken and, and the desktop software market in terms of personal finance. And the big challenge was convincing consumers to give. The, the company startup, which at the time was a one-man startup, you know, your password for your banking, yeah. you know, accounts, and yeah. it was like fun and to actually get there. Um, so whether it's Aaron Patzer or Julia and Kevin Hart at Even Bright or uh, James Spark uh, and Eric Friedman, Friedman at uh, Fitbit, and you know the the sort of very successful founders we've we've backed, they were sort of awesome, and we try and and sort of find this those sometimes obvious gems, sometimes hidden gems in uh, in the portfolio. And every time we sort of did a, a review of of the portfolio this morning, and you know we sort of pointed to the mistakes we made, and you know those were not awesome founders, we should have sort of selected them out uh, or filtered them out on that basis. And the mistakes you made, you put money in and you then, shouldn't have. And we shouldn't okay. have because okay. you know, the it. company sort of went sideways. Yeah. Um, in terms of the unicorns um, or the decacorns, uh, which are the $10 billion unicorns, <laughs> so LinkedIn was sort of one of the biggest mistakes I've made by passing uh, early on back in 2003 when I uh, had the opportunity to be the 14th angel and, you know, there were four different business social networks at the time. I'm not trying to give myself an excuse, but you know, I just didn't believe that they could actually scale in terms of both network and revenue to become something sort of big and important. Big mistake was Reed Hoffman is one of the most exceptional sort of in, uh, entrepreneurs of our time, and you should just blindly go behind him and that's it. Don't ask <laughs> questions. Invest. Back to your um, original point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, most the most recent uh, big mistake was passing on Uber. Um, and so I saw Uber in June of 2010. I was actually, I think, pretty early in seeing it. And the key issue I had was, at the time, uh, Travis was 
uh, essentially showing me Uber, but it was he and Garrett were the founders, but they were not involved in the company operationally. And, um, you know, Ryan Graves, who at the time was the general manager, wasn't uh, didn't convince me that he could actually run uh, this uh, um, this company. I see. And nothing personal against Ryan, who's still you know doing an awesome job at Uber. But I just I just didn't fit. And if I have questions about the leadership, then you know for me it's over. Yeah. Uh, tried to invest um, at the tail end of their uh, seed round, which was in around September of 2010. And said there was 100k left uh, in the round. I said, I'll take it, and they turned me down. Ah. Uh, and so, you know, that happened. That, that's my fault. I should have definitely sort of looked at the disruption in the experience and just said, you know, let's let's go do that. Uh, it's were, were those guys? Were they working at other companies at that time? Is so that Garrett was still at upon and Travis was still sort of retired, ah. and he joined Uber as a CEO. Uh, just a few weeks after I sort of tried to um, to invest in September. I uh, got it. Um, then, you know, there's uh, Airbnb, Twilio, but, you know, uh, Pinterest I completely ignored. Uh, but, you know, every time you look at the value proposition and what they had to show for when we passed, and it was like, I mean, I, I passed on airbed and breakfast. Yeah. So, you know, the notion of having an airbed in a in someone's home when you go to a conference, you know, to, uh, you know, really sort of have a cheap solution to stay. I remember that. And so, I, I thought it was crazy. I, I said, I would never do that. Like, who would ever want to sleep ever on someone's sofa, so, you know, you for know, money? And, and look, our job is to sort of see pretty much, not everything, because it's impossible to see everything today, but as much as possible of the everything pool, you know, of startups, and then figure out which ones, you know, will be successful. And, you know, as long as you have two, three, four, five of those per fund, then you will do well. Great. So, M Matthew, I think, I think we covered all of your, your stuff in there. Hopefully that, uh, that helps. Um, and, and we ask ourselves, and we did ask ourselves this morning, what can we change in our process to not say no to an Uber and to say yes to the things that end up, you know, flooding and not working? But the point is, we know that at least 30 to 40 percent of our companies will just go bust and implode in a very embarrassing way, because that's that's what we do. Yeah, I, I was gonna put um, pitch you on this, you know, new idea I have called Yo Yo. I don't know if you've seen that yet, but uh, it's gonna be big. So, I'm sure it's gonna so be watch big. out. I'll 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 let you know later. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, we have an email from Albert. How do most acquisitions happen? Is it the acquirer who approaches the startup, or vice versa? The best acquisitions are when the company, you know, the startup gets approached and by the, the acquirer yep. and essentially gets courted and, you know, when the acquirer is really trying to convince the founders to join in. Because that's what, you know, they will sort of really make sure that the terms and and the offer, you know, all sort of in, is interesting and and the founders sort of find a reason to uh, come in and join in and stick around for you know two three four five years yep. um, whenever you as a startup tries to get um, try to get bought uh, by someone it's it's typically you know uh, much much harder yeah yeah so I, I totally agree um, and the, and you know it's it's sort of like uh, dating right like the 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 if you're chasing the girl right um, she she gets to be very picky right and and so it's the same it's the same sort of thing um, you know having been through looking at uh, both sides actually with tello where you know initially we were looking for someone to buy us and then we switched to a new model and then people started coming to us yeah. uh one, one is a difference right yeah yeah there's a huge difference right in terms of leverage and and everything else so uh uh so yeah you want them coming after you and and uh, chasing you so i hope that uh helps albert good luck with that um let's see rick uh has a question how did your two partners end up joining soft tech what was it about them that made you interested I think you alluded to some of this earlier. Yeah, it's but, a great uh, question. So um, Charles uh, Hudson, my, my partner, I've known uh, for almost 14 years. Uh, so we met when I was investing for Reuters and he was investing for InQtel. Mm. And it was sort of uh, kind of interesting that we were looking at very similar deals, but he was coming at it from the intelligence community and I was looking at it from the you know, financial markets uh, sort of interest. Perspective, and I've always sort of found him super smart, 
um, is 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 one of the you know smartest person sort of I know, and um, we sort of have been friends for a long long time. And when I thought about you know the profile, expertise, experience, um, sort of values, behavior that I would like to see in my partner to be back in um, in 2010. He was one of the first, uh, you know, people I, I sort of chatted with, and I was lucky that um, at the time the startup he was with sort of had been acquired uh, by Zynga. His uh, own so media business had been acquired as well, and he was kind of available, looking at making investments. And so we sort of, sort of dated in the sense that we looked at deals together, and you know, we sort of figured out that we were sort of different enough that we could stretch ourselves and, and be honest to each other, so really be better investors as a, as, a, uh, as a duo. But still, we had enough mutual respect that we could agree on the right deals. And so I offered him to, uh, to join me as my, as my partner. And then um, about a year and a half later, uh, Siren told Siren DPD put Steph uh, in, f in front of us. So, uh, she comes from the East Coast. Uh, she's from Jersey Shore, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, and um, she, um, after doing an MBA at Columbia, she decided to uh, move to the um, to the West Coast and try and get a job in venture. And she, you know, came with two suitcases, uh, living on on someone's uh, sort of floor. And one of uh, my LPs, limited partners investor in in, the, in Softec, uh, is also a Columbia alum who made the intro and. So they just meet with her and, and sort of give her feedback as to what it means to find a job in venture. And I basically told her as um, a newly minted MBA that she should sort of get operating experience first and not try and work in venture because, mm. you know, venture is for older people, kind of, you know, <laughs> once you've, you've had uh, a bit of operating uh, experience. Turns out that um, she had 10 years of operating experience and she, d she had done an MBA afterwards and that just liked her a lot and I sort of said, hey, we never sort of thought of having Softec uh, have non-partner uh, sort of uh, execs, but we'll give you 10 weeks to prove to us two things that we need, you know, someone like you in, um, in at Softec as, as at that time a, a principal, uh, uh, we started as an associate and then a principal. And, you know, show us that you're the right person for us and we need someone like you. And, you know, she did a fantastic job. And after five weeks, uh, we basically offered her a uh, full-time job. Senior associate, a year later, she became principal. And she's now, you know, uh, in charge of education tech, uh, a lot of digital health. Uh, she's, you know, sitting on boards, making investments. She has, you know, the same voice uh, on the investment committee as Charles and I. And I'm very lucky to have uh, them both as, um, as my team. That's awesome. Well, uh, hopefully that answers the question, Rick. Um, but it's very challenging to um, to add someone to a VC firm because you want to make sure that there's enough, you know, difference, diversity, you know, uh, in terms of the way things are approached, so that you can stretch yourselves and and avoid the sort of mistakes I was referring to, but still that you're compatible enough that you will be enthusiastic about the same types of deals. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's kind of and you you have sort of the right set of values and everything. So it's it's actually not easy at all. Do you, you guys have to be unanimous, or uh, can there be a, a? It's interesting. I mean, with three, you with know, three, it's we, yeah, we, with three, we sort of have the rule that you know, if one of us really doesn't want to do the deal, then we'll we we'll just we'll just pass. Wow. And sometimes you have like two people who have very strong conviction, yeah, and like then. really, really want to do it, and then the third is like, eh, I'm not sure that Neutral, I like right? it, yeah. but. If you guys are so enthusiastic and I and I listen to you and I have my doubts and those are my doubts and we have sort of a healthy debates, that's why you know we um, we sometimes like we'll sometimes sleep on the deal. We'll say, well, let's just sleep on it. Let's just you know not decide today. We heard each other. Like let's talk about it. And, and you know what we've done a couple of times is whoever is the dissenter will sort of talk to the startup and try and get clarity on their own issues with the deal before making a final uh, sort of recommendation that's, decision. That's a good approach. Yeah, so not necessarily laying down across the tracks like no fucking way we're doing this, but... If it's if it's that, then we will pass. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, all right, well, uh, let's see. Uh, this one is from Dominic. Have you ever had to fire or replace the CEO of one of your companies? Uh, oh, yeah. If so, 
what set of circumstances led to that event? Dominic, I hope you're not in this situation where you're worrying about that, but uh, what, uh, what usually happens in those cases? So, um, answer is yes, several times. Um, and it's not only, I mean, it's, it's the CEO or you know, one of the co-founders or whatever. And to be clear, um, as seed investors, we sort of really buy into the team that we're going to be investing in. So yeah. if we think that you know there's like three founders and one of them doesn't sort of cut it or whatever for us, we won't invest. We never sort of s step in into an investment thinking. You know, those two awesome. This one is going to go. We just pass on the investment. So you know, if you look at what are the triggers for someone being you know removed, I think it's really sort of either. An issue with uh, ethics, uh, ethics sort of behavior, uh, you know, non, not delivering, not putting his weight, uh, not essentially uh, fulfilling on the responsibilities and, and, and tasks that have been sort of attributed to that person. So it's always, I mean, most often is just a, a lack of performance. Um, and if it's the CEO, it's just demonstrating that the leadership that is expecting from uh, expected from a um, uh, startup CEO is just not there. And to be honest, that means that if we have to replace the CEO during the seed round, we really screwed up. Yeah, because you should know that in advance. Because right? we should have sort of spotted that. But you know, uh, we don't shy away from doing what is needed, and you know, will affect transitions. All right, and and you know, having lived on multiple sides of that equation, uh, those are always uh, tough situations. So yes, uh, it's it's really important those to try and be objective and not uh, not overreact and just sort of listen to the feedback and do what's best for the company. So uh, I know that's sometimes hard and there are disagreements, but uh, you know those things happen. Um, all right, I think I think we've got time maybe for one more here. Um, uh, this is from Jackson. When a company is in need of a bridge loan, what goes into your decision process when thinking about whether or not to continue supporting the company? So, you know, I lived through this as well, and um, you're always wondering, hey, are, are you going to support us, or are you going like, to sort of leave us to die, or, you know, what's going on? So, um, uh, how, how do you guys look at that? I'm sure that's come up, you know, many, many times. Oh, um, many, many times, and, and it's, it's happening, you know, even more these days where, you know, what it takes to actually raise a Series A uh, in terms of hurdles has sort of gone up. And so you have a number of companies, especially if they raised, you know, uh, a small seed round 18 months ago. And small seed round means like 750 to a million, right. Right, which is a small seed round yeah. these days. Um, <laughs> Crazy. Because we always want, you know, to see 18 to 24 months of runway when you raise. So that's why most of what we do is like 1.5 to 2, right? Yeah. So we look at, the performance of the company, how well they have executed, you know, how far they are from actually getting, you know, those sets of of performance indicators to the point of raising a Series A, and you know, sometimes we'll offer, you know, to lead a, um, a sort of a seed round bridge, whatever, an extension. Sometimes we'll try and bring in other. Uh, new investors who are focused on, you know, the seed stage or the seed prime stage. Yeah. Uh, you have a few funds which are doing nothing but seed primes, so they are here to be, you know, leading the those extensions, and will either sort of lean in uh, and and support and help if ever the company has executed, or we'll just have a very frank conversation with the founder saying, look, you might want to try and, and raise more, but you know, we don't think that. Even with that extra run, where you'll get to the point of being able to raise a Series A, because we see all those issues, and so our input is we should just try and sell the company. Yeah. And that won't be an easy conversation, but yeah. we'll have the conversation. And typically, it won't be sort of at the last minute. Like we'll sort of give feedback to the entrepreneur, uh, you know, consistently over the course of uh, the seed round sort of uh, execution. And it won't be a surprise to them if we decide to just, you know, hold off. Yeah. But if I look at, you know, the last couple of years where we must have done 10, 12, 15 sort of bridges, uh, it's the rarest exception that we end up, you know, not participating. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. And I'm sorry we didn't get all your questions. But uh, if you want, you can... Uh, 
tweet or email uh, to either of us and we'll see if we can help you out. Um, thank you for being such a great guest. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. Uh, you can uh, follow Jeff and Softech on Twitter. Uh, his handle is at Jeff, so he's one of those first name guys. And uh, Softech VC with two T's. With two T's. So don't forget the second T. Um, we are taking next week off, so uh, tune in on August 21st, which is two weeks from today, for the next episode of Founderline. Our guest will be Heidi Roizen, who's an operating partner at DFJ. Um, Heidi's an amazing person, amazing. and I'm sure it'll be a great show. Um, that will be Thursday, August 21st at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Um, thank you once again to our great sponsors, Oric and Ustream. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. You can also email questions in advance to help at founderline.com. Uh, you can go to our website and you can subscribe to email updates, uh, watch the previous episodes. This one will probably be up tomorrow sometime. Uh, and you can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again in two weeks.